Okay, so before we start, um, just a quick recap of the major or the most important uh, aspects of the previous lecture. Uh, the first thing that uh, we've covered was the fused deposition modeling process. And it is important that uh, you uh, remember its working principle. So as you've seen, in general, in terms of FDM, we need a filament spool. The materials that are commonly used in fused deposition modeling are thermoplastic materials, so materials that can be melted and extruded into the building platform and subsequently uh, solidified to form uh, three-dimensional parts. Uh, this happens by pulling these filaments into the print head, where it's then uh, melted and then forced through a nozzle into uh, the building platform. Uh, there are some uh, uh, variations in terms of the commercial system. So you can have the X, Y displacements on the building platform, whilst the printhead move in the Z uh, direction, or it can be the other way around. You can have the Z uh, displacements on the building platform, whilst uh, the printhead moves along the X and Y uh, axis. We've also said that there are two uh, major extrusion mechanisms and there are some important differences between them. So one is the piston assisted system and the other is the screw assisted system. Um, normally in terms of piston assisted system, we have um, an activation of this plunge to push the material through the nozzle, either using a pneumatic system or um, a motor assisted system. And in the, crew, in the screw based system, we normally have a screw that has a rotational movement and is that rotational movement that forces the molten material to be extruded into uh, the building platform. And there are some advantages and uh, limitations of these uh, systems. In the case of pressure assisted, this is normally used for low viscosity materials. It has lower accuracy when compared to the screw uh, assisted uh, mechanisms, but also it requires longer uh, production times and it has the advantage of being compatible with living cells. And this is particularly important for uh, medical applications as we've discussed in the previous lecture. The screw rotational systems, they allow you to print uh, highly viscous materials. It also provides you with higher accuracy in terms of the filaments that are printed onto the building platform. You also have uh, uh, lower building times, so the time to actually print your part is uh, lower when compared to the piston assisted mechanisms, but it is not compatible with uh, living cells, mainly due to the shear forces and the temperature that is normally involved in the printing process. We've also said that independently of the mechanisms, there are four main parameters or process parameters that you can control uh, in order to print your material into the building platform. One is the melting temperature. The other is the inlet pressure. And this is particularly important for pressure assisted systems, the screw rotation speed and the scanning speed. Obviously you want to tune these materials in order to print parts that are geometrically uh, accurate uh, and also dimensionally accurate, but also you want to set up these processes in order to reduce uh, the building time. And this normally is a trade-off between all these parameters. But what you need to know is that as you increase the melting temperature or you increase the inlet pressure or you increase the rotational speed, you'll have a higher flow of material coming out of the nozzle and therefore your filament diameter will also increase. On the other hand, if you increase the scan speed, what you are actually doing is stretching the filaments that are being printed onto the build platform and this will reduce uh, their uh, diameter and therefore their size. So these parameters uh, and the influence of uh, these parameters on the filament diameter it's uh, important to understand. And it's also important that you have an idea that uh, the tuning of these parameters will obviously depend on each specific material that you are uh, using to build your parts. 
In terms of the advantages and the, the limitations of fused deposition modeling, we know and we've discussed that uh, extrusion-based systems are quite attractive for the industry and mainly due to the low cost of the equipment. And we've said that nowadays you can buy 3D printers for less than a thousand pounds. The diversity of materials. So there is a wide range of thermoplastic materials that can be used with different mechanical properties uh, to build uh, uh, functional prototypes or parts. And also the ease of operation. These are uh, systems that are quite easy to, to operate. However, we've also discussed some uh, drawbacks or limitations of these systems. So on top of the need to actually have uh, pre-filament, so you need, to, uh, before you actually print your part, you need to fabricate the thermoplastic uh, filaments. Uh, the high temperatures that you need to melt those materials and the support structures, the systems in general are also limited in terms of, for example, the build speed. So the speed of, uh, of an FDM system is mainly reliant on the feed rates and the plotting speed. We know that the feed rate is also dependent on the ability of the supply um, uh, of, of the material and the rate at which the liquefier can actually melt uh, the material and feed it through the nozzle. So we said that we need substantial improvements in order uh, to also uh, reduce the friction of the system and therefore increase the building speed. The other important uh, limitation is the accuracy that is normally limited to 0.078 millimeters. And this is for the high cost printers. And finally, but also uh, very important, uh, the part uh, anisotropy. So typically properties are isotropic in the XY plane, but if the raster fill pattern is set to preferentially deposit along a specific direction, then the properties in this plane, in the XY plane, will also be an isotropic. In almost every case, um, the, the strength in the vertical direction or in the Z direction is uh, less than the strength in the XY plane. Okay, so these are some of the limitations of the process that you need to uh, know. Also, we've looked at VAT photopolymerization and mainly we've looked into uh, stereolithography systems. And we said that there are primarily two configurations. One is the vector scan, and the other one is the mask projection. And we've said that the main advantage of using mask uh, Yes, if, uh, if I hope you can still hear me, but there's a lesson one negative numbers. Can you download them? Sorry. Okay, um, so we've said that there are two main uh, projection mechanisms. One is the mask projection and the other one is the vector scan. And the major advantage of using mask projection is the build speed. And mainly because you are irradiating uh, an entire layer at a time. The vector scan is um, not as fast as the mask projection because we're irradiating point by point but it has the advantage of being, uh, from an energetic point of view, much more efficient. And mainly because all the energy of the laser is concentrated in one point, and therefore the reaction, uh, the cross-linking reaction of the photopolymer occurs as, uh, in a much faster way. In terms of the advantages of photopolymerization, one is the flexibility of the system because it can accommodate different machine configurations, as we've said, either mask projection or uh, vector scan. And we can also print it uh, at different sizes depending on the size of the building platform. The build speed, and this is particularly important or probably more relevant when using mask projection, uh, which uh, gives the system um, a very high speed compared to other systems in uh, additive manufacturing and the accuracy, which is in general much, much higher than any other additive manufacturing systems. So we can actually print, for example, at the nanometer scale, scale with a very high resolution, which is something impossible for other additive manufacturing systems like fuse deposition modeling, 
uh, or powder pet fusion or even binder jetting. But the systems also have uh, disadvantages and there are some major uh, limitations. One is the limited range of materials, which is normally limited to photopolymers uh, that are commercially available as acrylate materials or epoxy resins. The other one is the degradation of uh, the parts after being printed um, and also the need for post uh, curing uh, after you actually print the parts. The strength of the parts is also uh, lower when compared to other uh, systems and they also have uh, a lower durability. So these are just some key points of the last lecture and today we're going to be looking at binder jetting processes, uh, just to give you uh, a brief historical perspective, how the system works, the different materials that can be used, some of the major applications, and the advantages and limitations of these systems compared to uh, the others like FDM or powder bed fusion. And we'll do the same for powder bed fusion. Uh, in particular, we're going to be looking at selective laser sintering. Um, and this is a, a, a process that is quite relevant for uh, the industry, in particular for automotive and aerospace industry, as we've discussed in the previous lectures. Okay, so uh, it's interesting that this system is also commonly known as three-dimensional printing. And very often the term 3D printing is uh, used to um, when, when you want to talk about uh, inkjet printing. But uh, the real uh, name or the most accurate name is uh, binder jetting. And this was developed by Sachs around 89 in the MIT and has been licensed for uh, more than five companies uh, for commercialization. So it's one of the oldest uh, 3D printing systems uh, that are around in the markets and still uh, commercialized nowadays. But how does this work? So in this process uh, and different from the other ones, what we have is a liquid binder uh, droplets that are selectively deposited over a powder uh, bed. So here you can see the binder uh, reservoirs. So you can have different binders. And in here you have your uh, building platform. This is the reservoir of powder material. And this is the roller that will dispense the powder material onto the building platform. Once the, uh, the first layer is printed, the powder bed is lowered according to the slice thickness of the parts and the new layer of powder is spread onto it. This process is then repeated until you obtain um, a three-dimensional part. Also uh, important is that the 3D printed parts is normally left in the powder bed after being printed. Uh, in order for the binder to fully set and for the green parts to uh, gain strength. One of the limitations of this process is that after you print the parts, you normally have to uh, go through a stage of post-processing. And this usually involves removing the parts from the powder bed, remove the unbound uh, powder, so the material that was not um, glued uh, together and you can use compressed air to remove that and then you need to infiltrate the parts in order to make it stronger. I don't have time to show you the video but you can access this on the Blackboard page where you can see a demonstration of uh, what I am talking about in here. In terms of the technology that is available in the market there are two main mechanisms uh, of ejection of uh, the binder. So the main distinction when categorizing uh, these common technologies refers to the possible modes of expulsion of the droplets. You can either have a continuous uh, stream or drop on demand. And this distinction uh, refers to the form in which the liquid exits the nozzle. That can be either as a continuous stream or in the form of single uh, droplets. And how does this work? So in terms of a uh, continuous stream, the first uh, step is that a steady pressure is applied to the fluid reservoir 
So using this actuator, um, a steady pressure is applied inside the print head or the fluid uh, reservoir. And this will cause a pressurized column of fluid to be ejected from the nozzle. After departing uh, the nozzle, this stream breaks into droplets, mainly due to Rayleigh uh, instability. The breakup can be made more consistent uh, by vibrating or perturbing um, at a fixed uh, frequency, normally close to the spontaneous uh, droplet formation rate, in which case the droplet formation process can be synchronized with the force vibration and the ink droplets of uh, uh, uniform mass in general are ejected. The deposition into the substrate or the building platform is controlled by introducing a charging field into your uh, particles or into your droplets. These charged particles then pass through a deflection field, which normally directs the particles to the desired destinations and will help you print the, the geometry and the dimensions that you want according to each uh, layer of your parts. In general, the droplets that are formed using this kind of ejection mechanisms are of uh, normally around 150 microns in uh, diameter. In terms of uh, drop on demand and different from continuous stream, in this case, what we have is individual droplets that are produced directly uh, from the nozzle. So in this case, we don't have a continuous stream uh, exiting the nozzle. What we have is single uh, droplets. These droplets are formed only when individual pressure pulses in the nozzle are applied and cause the fluid uh, to be expelled through the nozzle. These uh, pressure pulses are, are normally um, created at specific times and we can use also different types of actuators, as we'll see uh, later on. They can be either thermal, uh, electrostatic, piezoelectric. Uh, there are also acoustic um, actuators and others, depending on uh, the commercial mechanism. Uh, this is actually the most common uh, ejection mechanisms on commercial systems uh, nowadays. And it has the advantage of producing much smaller uh, droplets and this allows you to print parts at higher uh, resolution as well and with much more precision. And that's why uh, they are actually the most commercial uh, used uh, ejection mechanisms in by the jetting uh, printers. So when we look at the differences between continuous stream and drop on demand, uh, there are uh, some important things to note. In terms of the advantages, obviously the continuous stream allows you to uh, eject more materials, so the throughput rate is uh, higher, but it's also limited uh, by uh, two main things. One is the need to actually charge the material. If you don't charge the material, you're not able to control where is it going to be deposited on the building platform. And also uh, the fluid that is deflected into the capture uh, must be uh, disposed or uh, reprocess. Okay, and this obviously brings additional costs, uh, more time uh, to print, and are obviously a uh, disadvantage uh, when you think about 3D printing. On the other hand, with drop on demand, we can print much smaller uh, droplet sizes, which gives us much higher resolution, much higher accuracy in terms of the parts that we print. Okay, so these are important. Uh, differences between these two systems that you need to uh, remember. As we've said, in terms of the droplet formation, there are uh, different types of actuators that we can use, but probably the two more uh, common mechanisms are the thermal and the piezoelectric. I think that we have a question. Yes? Yes, sir. Um, why do, if there's um, a steady, a steady flow, that they're not droplets one, why would they need, to, why would the material need, need to be able to take a charge? So you need to take a charge, uh, especially in the continuous stream, because once ejected from uh, the nozzle, let me just go back. So when the binder material 
is ejected from the nozzle, it's in the form of a continuous stream. So we don't have droplets. Then once you form the droplets, you need to be able to direct these droplets into um, the substrate, okay? And this is basically because you need to be able to control where they're going to be deposited according to the geometry that you have defined for each layer. And if you, if you don't charge these particles, then you're not able to direct them using this uh, catcher, okay? So the only reason why you charge these droplets is in order to control the position where they're going to be um, deposited onto the substrate. So, so what does the catcher do with the, like the deflection plates? They move it into the right position depending on the charge. Yeah. So basically and here, they are not aligned. Okay. So different from, for example, in uh, drop on demand, you have single droplets. And by having single droplets, you can easily place them into the substrate simply just by positioning the print head on the right location. In this case, because you have a continuous stream and then you break them into single droplets, they are not aligned with the print head nozzle. And because of that, you need to charge them. And what the droplet will do is to attract the particles into the right position that they need to be onto the platform. So the catch is, it's basically like using, for example, a magnet, okay? Uh, so that will be like placed next to where you want it to land. So they'll exactly. move, to, move towards it and then past it. Exactly. Because here, because they are not aligned with the nozzle, okay, you need to be able to catch them and deflect them to the right position. Right. What's ensuring there's no like splash or anything? Sorry, I cannot, uh, I can, I can catch that. What, what ensures there isn't a splash? From well, because what? basically um, they will not touch the, the, the deflector. So these droplets will not um, be touching this deflector because it's coated and it's charged also in a way that um, it's repulsive uh, to the particles. Okay, so it has a minimal charge that will allow the particles to be deflected, but not crashed against the deflector. And when they land, what stops them from splashing? Well, uh, simply it's, it's just the distance between the deflector and the substrate. So they will always splash, okay? But the distance is very small. Obviously here oh. it's exaggerated, but this distance is very, very small, okay? That's why they don't splash. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're saying that in terms of the droplet formation, we can have different types of actuators, but probably the most important ones are the thermal and the piezoelectric. In terms of the thermal, uh, these systems um, normally use a heater. What this heater will do inside your print head is to create uh, a bubble that will expand and as the bubble expands, this will reduce the volume inside your print head and force the ejection of single uh, droplets. The same uh, principle applies to piezoelectric, but in this case, it relies upon the deformation of the piezoelectric elements to reduce the volume of the liquid inside the reservoir, and this will cause uh, the droplets to be ejected. Waveforms uh, employed in piezoelectric driven systems can vary from uh, simple positive square waves to uh, more complex negative positive negative waves. Uh, and in this case, the amplitude, uh, the duration and other parameters can be carefully modulated as the droplets are ejected from um, the printhead into the building platform. And this is one of the most commonly used uh, systems in terms of droplet formation because it allows you a higher precision, higher accuracy, and much more control over the different uh, parameters that um, will influence uh, not just the size, but also the frequency at which the droplets are ejected from uh, the printer. 
So in terms of uh, materials, the most common materials uh, in terms of 3D printing or inkjet printing are waxy polymers. Uh, we can also use acrylic photopolymers. Uh, so similar to the ones that I used in SLA. So there are now systems uh, based on binder jetting that use photopolymers. So it's a mix uh, between inkjet and SLA and uh, plasma materials. Obviously, uh, there, are, there is quite a lot of research in terms of materials in order to expand the range of materials that can be used in binder jetting. There is quite a lot of research in terms of polymeric uh, materials, uh, ceramics and uh, metals. Just uh, an important uh, mention to the fact that if you use ceramic materials or metals, obviously the parts that you will print, they will not be composed 100% of metals or ceramics, okay? You always have to have something to bind these uh, particles together. And basically because you're not using any temperature, uh, you're not gonna be able to fuse the metals together, okay? And the same applies for uh, ceramic particles. The range of applications, it's quite broad uh, from architectural models to bike seats to soul sets but probably the most common application of binder jetting is the building of anatomical models for uh, surgical procedures. So this is quite important for doctors to actually plan complex surgeries. Uh, in many cases, what happens is that before the surgery, the patient is submitted to a CT scanning or an MRI, and then using reverse engineering, it is possible to reconstruct the area that is going to be um, affected during the surgery so that the surgeons can plan in detail uh, the surgery, the intervention, and minimize the risks for uh, the patients. Yes, I guess there is, there is a question. Um, hi, uh, you said with regards to metals, um, it's not going to be completely metal because we're not using heat and there's always a binding material. So does that mean if you 3D print something out of metal, it's only as strong as it's binding material? Uh, it's gonna be a combination of both, but in this case, you're not gonna have, like you said, uh, you're not gonna have 100% uh, metals. What you're gonna have is a mix of a binder uh, and uh, the metal. And obviously, if you compare uh, a metallic part that is printed using inkjets with uh, another part that is printed using, for example, powder bed fusion, where you actually have to melt or to sinter uh, the metal. Even if you use the same material, the same metal, the mechanical properties will be lower in the part that is uh, fabricated using uh, binder jetting because it's not 100% composed of uh, metals. Okay, and in a in up to a certain degree, the mechanical properties will also depend of um, the ability of the binder to glue the particles together. Mm, I see. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, so in terms of advantages, uh, one of the advantages of binder jetting is the low cost. So in general, uh, printing machines can be assembled from standard components like drives, stages, uh, print heads, while other machines have many more um, uh, parts that are specific uh, to that printing uh, mechanism. Also, the speed or the high speed in, is normally an advantage in binder jetting. So by using uh, multiple print heads with hundreds of nozzles, it is possible to um, eject uh, a significant amount of material uh, much faster uh, over a considerable area of the building platform. Scalability, it means that uh, printing speed can be increased by adding uh, other printing heads to the machine. Uh, this is relatively easy to do, and it's normally much easier uh, to, to, to actually uh, add multiple printing heads in uh, binder jetting uh, than, for example, it is to do in stereolithography or FDM or SLS uh, machines. You can also print multiple materials and you can print in colors. This is uh, obviously also another advantage of uh, binder jetting. 
you can have the ability to induce microporosity, and this is particularly important for um, biomedical applications. And from a sustainable point of view, uh, the use of water as a binder for specific materials, obviously, can also be considered as an advantage. And similar to other uh, additive manufacturing processes, we also have uh, limitations. And one of the limitations is the choice of materials. As we've seen, currently, we can only use waxes and photopolymers uh, in commercial uh, machines, although research is being conducted to develop polymerics and ceramic and metal materials to expand the range of applications in terms of binder jetting. We're also uh, limited in terms of the part accuracy, uh, and this is uh, particularly relevant for large parts, which is generally not as good as in other processes like uh, photo uh, polymerization. Uh, the mechanical properties are normally inferior when compared to um, powder bed fusion, where we can use, for example, metals or polymers with high mechanical resistance. We can also have uh, trapped uh, materials, especially in hollow parts, because of the loose powder that is used to support the parts whilst it's being printed. And we always need to do some post-processing. Uh, post-processing to remove the loose powder, but also to infiltrate our parts and make it um, mechanically strong. Are there any questions regarding uh, binder jetting they would like to ask now? before we move on to powder bed fusion. No? Okay. <clears throat> so in terms of powder bed fusion, I'm not gonna talk um, too much in detail about uh, laser melting. I'm going to focus more on uh, laser sintering. And this was developed and, and obviously patented by Carl Deckard, uh, and his academic advisor, uh, Joe Beeman, at the University of Texas, uh, also in the mid 80s. Um, and this uh, was a project that was sponsored at the time by the, the Defense Advanced Research Projects uh, Agency. SLS was first commercialized uh, powder bed fusion system, so it was commercialized before uh, laser melting. Deckard and Beeman uh, were also involved in the resulting startup company, the DTM. Uh, you've probably heard of, uh, of this company. It was established to design uh, and build uh, SLS machines. And probably back in 2000, 2001, uh, 3D Systems, uh, which is probably nowadays the biggest uh, 3D printing company in the world, uh, bought DTM and acquired the SLS uh, technology as well. So. Um, 3D systems actually nowadays uh, is uh, one of the major um, plays in terms of uh, laser sinting technology because of what uh, they've acquired from uh, DTM in terms of the patents, in terms of technology that was initially uh, developed. So in this case, um, how, does the, how does the system work? Uh, similar to uh, binder jetting, we also have powder uh, materials. We have uh, a chamber where we have uh, the powder material uh, that can be a metal or a polymer. We have a roller that is used to dispense the powder material onto the building platform. And then we have another reservoir for the excessive material that is not using uh, during the building of the 3D parts. In order to build each layer, we use a high power laser. This laser is directed onto the building platform using uh, mirrors, and once projected onto the building platform, what this laser will do is to sinter or to melt the powder particles uh, together, forming um, a, solid, uh, part, uh, a solid part. Once the first layer is built, and similar to the other additive manufacturing processes, this platform will lower according to the slice thickness that you define on uh, the printing software and the roll dispense another layer on top of the previous one and the process restarts. In this case, it's also important to mention that the loose powder can be used as a support material. So we don't actually need to build the support structures as we normally do in fused deposition modeling. But it is important that you remember that this is not the case 
uh, for all the materials. Okay, so if in the case of uh, polymeric materials, we don't need to actually build support structures because we can use the loose powder to support our parts. In the case of metals, we do need to build those support structures. And the main reason here is because we use much higher melting temperatures and also uh, because we use much higher melting temperatures, we can also have uh, much higher levels of uh, shrinkage. So in order to avoid that, we need to build those support structures. Uh, excuse there me. are, yes. Excuse me. Can you repeat why we don't need to, um, why we don't need to build uh, support structures for metals? Oh, why we need actually, no. sorry. No, yeah, okay. So. Uh, basically, uh, you need support structures when you are printing uh, metals with selective laser sintering. And the main reason why you need that is because the temperatures that you use to actually uh, sinter the parts or to melt, to, to melt the parts is much higher. Okay, And because of that, you can have shrinkage and warpage. And in order to avoid that, you normally have to build those support structures. In the case of polymers, that is normally not required because the melting temperature of the polymers is lower and also the shrinkage is, is lower when compared to uh, the metals that are normally used in powder bed fusion. Okay, thanks a lot. Sir? Yes? Um, with the metals, um, the support structures, will they have to be built entirely before you start doing or can they be built as you're doing it? Yeah, so it's it's exactly as in um, in uh, FDM or any other system. So you build support structures um, at the same time as you build uh, your your parts. Okay, so in a layer you may have to actually uh, print your uh, parts uh, or the sections of your parts, and together with that you build your support structures. Okay, so you build them layer by layer. Um, at the same time as you are building um, your your actual parts, just similar to, to FDM. Would you have to switch the laser? You'd probably, uh, one of the things that, uh, it, one of the things, or one of the limitations of uh, laser sintering or laser melting is that there are not uh, many processes that can use multiple materials. So normally the support structures are built using the same material. And this requires that after the printed process is completed, you need to remove the parts and then you need to uh, physically remove the support structures. Okay, for example, using uh, cutting mechanisms. So how, yes, I was wondering, how do you differentiate between the support and the Part that will be just merged together and then you have to chop it up afterwards or it, yes so have different properties so normally uh, it, it's easy to to identify the support structures because normally the support structures are uh, uh, in the form of, of, of beams okay so you have this uh, lattice structure that is supporting a more solid construct and what you do is then to remove uh, that you can also um, creates features, geometrical features at the interface between the, um, the part that you are building and the support structure so that you know exactly where to uh, break them and where to remove them. Okay, thank you. Okay, so also in terms of part of bed fusion, there are uh, four primary binding mechanisms um, that are typical of these systems. Uh, solid state sintering, chemically induced binding, liquid phase sintering, also known as partial melting and full melting. Okay, so we don't need to know all these uh, fusion mechanisms. We're only going to focus on uh, liquid uh, phase sintering, which is uh, the most common uh, system commercially available. <clears throat> so, in terms of liquid phase sintering, uh, this normally refers to the fusion of powder particles uh, when a portion of the material becomes molten while the other portions uh, remain uh, solid. So in liquid phase sintering, the molten uh, constituents 
normally acts as a glue which binds the solid particles together. And you can have four different types of particles that you can use to build your uh, parts. You can have separate particles. So in this case, what you have on your building platform is a mix of both uh, binding particles and uh, powder materials that is going to be used to actually build your parts, okay? And they are mixed in the same uh, building platform. You can also have composite particles. So in this case, you first need to create a composite material that contains both the binder and the structural material. And a variation of this is the coated particle. So in this case, you normally have your structural material in the core of your particle. And this core particle is then coated with a binder that allows the laser then to melt it and join them together. The other um, also common um, type of particle is the use of indistinct binder and structural uh, material. So this is um, very similar to separate particles and this mechanism is quite uh, common in, uh, in polymeric materials, okay? Less common in metals, but very common in uh, polymers. In terms of materials, so there is a wide range of materials that can be used in laser sintering from polymers to metals and ceramics. So basically any material that can be melted and solidified normally can be used in powder bed fusion. Uh, polymers, uh, or in the case of polymers, the most common material used in powder bed fusion is polyamide, uh, which is commercially known as, uh, you probably have heard before, uh, nylon. Polystyrene-based polymers and PIC um, are also uh, available uh, commercially. And there's quite a lot of research in terms of other polymers like polycapalactone, polylactic acid, and PLLA. So a wide range of polymers with uh, very different properties that can be used uh, in selective laser sintering. But probably the most important um, materials or class of materials for laser sintering, and that has actually um, uh, made many companies um, adopting this uh, technology is the ability of using metals. So generally any metal that can be welded is considered to be good um, as a good candidate for, for powder bed fission processing. So several types of steels, um, typically stainless and, and tool steels, um, but also titanium um, can be a, a good metal to be used in powder bed fusion. There are several ceramic materials available uh, commercially, including, for example, aluminum oxide and titanium oxide. And there is uh, a huge amount of research uh, being conducted, for example, in terms of the use of hydroxypatides for medical applications. So as you can easily see, um, one of the advantages of powder bed fusion uh, and similar, for example, to fused deposition modeling, it's the wide range of materials that can be used. I'm not expecting you to know all the materials that um, can be processed, like you know PLA or PCL or titanium, but I hope that you remember that you can use uh, a wide range of materials, including polymers, metals, and ceramics. And what are the requirements of those materials to be processed using powder bed fusion systems? And um, in terms of applications, uh, the range and similar to other systems, it's quite, quite broad. But as we've seen in one of the first lectures, uh, the ability to use metals is one of the main advantages in terms of powder bed fusion, both in terms of automotive industry, as well as um, uh, aerospace, but mainly in terms of um, the biomedical industry with the ability to create uh, prosthetic implants for uh, different purposes. I think we have a question, yes? Yes, hi, sir. My question would be, yes. can we use uh, composite? Yes, so as, as we've seen before uh, in the previous slide, you can create composite particles. And those composite particles obviously allow you to build uh, composite materials. But obviously one of, uh, one of the, the, the limitations, I mean, 
I, I don't think that will still be a limitation for many, many years, but one of the limitations currently is the, the limited um, range of materials they can use at the same time, like multiple materials selected laser sintering systems, as you have, for example, in um, fuse deposition modeling or by the jetting. Okay, so that, that is a, a limitation that doesn't allow you to build these composite parts, but you can use um, composite particles to build parts using uh, part of bed fusion. Thank you, sir. So in terms of advantages, and as we've mentioned, the range of materials is uh, a benefit of part of bed fusion. As we've said, support materials, uh, it's also uh, advantages, and specifically in the case of polymeric materials, where the loose powder can be used to support the building process of our parts. Uh, this, and because we can use this loose powder to, to, to support the building process, it also allows us to build uh, very complex geometries or more complex geometries compared to other uh, 3D printing processes that require the use of support structures. And obviously because of the materials that are used, uh, like metals and uh, polymers, we also uh, can build parts with high mechanical properties uh, or higher mechanical properties compared to uh, other systems like SLA or binder jetting. In terms of the limitations, and this is a common problem to most of the powder-based uh, systems, surface finish uh, and accuracy can be uh, a limitation. Okay. Um, however, the accuracy and the surface finishy uh, can be strongly influenced by the operating conditions and the size of the powders that uh, we use to build our parts. So the finer particle sizes, um, the better surface finish uh, you will uh, obtain and also more accurate parts um, can be uh, built. One other problem is uh, the shrinkage. Obviously, this depends on uh, the materials. Um, and a way of trying to limit the shrinkage in powder bed fusion is the usage of a chamber where we can control um, the environmental conditions. So normally, the 3D printing process or the selective laser sintering process is conducted in a chamber that is preheated and by raising the temperature inside the building chamber, uh, you obviously reduce the shrinkage because the temperature inside the chamber is much closer to the temperature they use to uh, sinter the particles or to melt them. And this will obviously reduce the shrinkage of your parts. In terms of uh, productivity, the total part uh, construction can be limited. And this is normally um, affected by the need that you have before you actually start printing to have a specific amount of time to actually heat up the chamber and to reach a specific temperature to avoid shrinkage of your parts. So this will uh, increase the building time or the total building time of your parts. And because of the process itself, we need to use high power lasers. This, uh, the laser itself, is quite costly or more costly, for example, compared to uh, SLA that also uses lasers, but also the amount of energy that is required to sinter the particles or to melt the particles together is also uh, much higher. So the entire process is also much costly. So um, this brings us to the end of our lecture. So just to summarize and things that you need to remember, in terms of binder jetting, there are two main mechanisms to uh, generate droplets. One is a continuous stream. The other one is drop on demand. And the drop on demand is the one that is more commercially used nowadays, okay? And mainly because it allows you to obtain higher accuracy and higher resolution when compared to continuous uh, stream. Some of the main advantages in terms of binder jetting is one, the cost, but it's normally lower compared to the other processes. You can also have higher speed or building uh, uh, speed. And this because you can actually in, uh, incorporate multiple printing heads with hundreds of nozzles, and you can also scale it up. 
In terms of drawbacks, it's limited in terms of the range of materials that are available and the overall accuracy compared to other uh, 3D printing systems. Laser sintering, the most used or the most common uh, binding mechanism is uh, LPS, okay, that refers to the mechanism of fusion of the powder particles. Um, you can have different types of particles that you can use in uh, powder bed fusion. Uh, the main advantages of these systems compared to other additive manufacturing are the range of materials, the need, uh, in this case, uh, the absence of support structures, in particular for polymeric materials. Um, and this obviously allows you to build parts that are, uh, from a geometrical point of view, much more complex than with other uh, systems. And in terms of the limitations and common to other powder-based systems, the surface finish is normally sacrificed. You can have very high shrinkage, especially with metal uh, parts. And the building time or the productivity can be lowered um, if you have um, the need to actually um, heat up and cool down the building chamber. 